Mario Molina helped to discover the link between CFC emissions and the depletion of the ozone layer. This experience has made him optimistic that science and politics can come together to solve the energy problem. Robert Lochlin is much more sceptical. He believes economic forces may make any political solutions impossible. We've not met, I think, Bob Lochlin. Hi. Very well, yeah. I guess. There's a, a huge prospect for fusion, but I think what you can learn from the past and from Fukushima, which is... Which laureate will our young scientists agree with? How do we convince people that the energy problem of 2020, of 2050, are crucial now? We can't just wait until 2019 to resolve a okay. 2020 issue. To solve the problem, you have to put a price on emissions. At least you have to charge more for energy to induce the other uses because they are not yet quite as cheap. Many people in society are sort of very reluctant, say, to pay more for gasoline in the United States. If, mm -hmm. so, if a politician say, OK, I'm going to raise the price of gas, it's like mm -hmm. political suicide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it makes sense. We have to ask the question, why is the price of oil what it is? We're using okay. too much? No, that's a non sequitur. The price of oil is what it is because we're using too much. It's not true. It's supply and demand, okay? So it's people who have drilled for the oil, they've got it, and now they charge the most they can to make the most profits. Well, why can't you just pass laws that, that fix the price? Well, you just can't. Fuel is more or less twice as expensive in Europe as it is in the States. And, but think about that in a minute. You'll see it can't be. If you have an com internationally competitive industry like airlines, mm -hmm. it cannot be so that Lufthansa is paying twice as much for its fuel as United Airlines because it's a fuel intensive industry and if you double the price they'd go out of business. So it must be so, there's an exception. There's a byline in the European, in the EU laws specifically exempting airlines from, from high prices of fuel. You're describing what I call a market failure. Of, of course, since oil is cheap, you can just take it out of the ground. So of course, it's going to be hard to compete with uh, our solar is coming down in price, but not fast enough and so on. So that's why to fix the market failure, we're, we're talking about government intervention, but it has to be a global agreement. Yeah. All the countries yeah. agree, and it's done. <laughs> it's so, in principle, it could it, be done, yeah. but it's, of course, it's extremely difficult. Well. The point I was trying to make is that it isn't possible. That's just wrong. The energy problem is an engineering problem. You must put on an engineering hat and solve it. And that's different from passing laws to change economics. Uh, he is more interested in using the legislative process to pass laws that regulate people's behavior. So he wants to regulate. I want to engineer. That's the difference. If the price of these uh, alternative energies doesn't come down fast enough, uh, there has to be some sort of international agreement which directly or indirectly compensates for this market failure. Are you folks at all concerned about the future of your progeny? Yes. <laughs> Most, yeah. most certainly. So let me float a question now. How long before the fossil energy runs out? How long is that? Depends on oh. consumption. Right. Guess. Need to no, no, you're, you're evading the question. Now, just guess. Uh, yeah, yes. 100 what, years. You say 100 years? Yeah. That's, that. that's the rough estimate, so plus or minus the same Okay, 100 deviation. years. Okay. Now, let's do worst case scenario. Okay. Everyone fails, the 100 years comes, the fossil energy runs out, then what? I think we can't let it, we can't let it get No, there. no, I don't, that, this is not an allowed answer, okay? <laughs> because as you know, as you know, the way of politics is the worst possible solution is almost always the solution you get, okay? So it's not an unreasonable question to ask. What is the consequence? Do you think that needs to happen? We do have precedents. It doesn't have to be that. If I may butt in, that statement is false. If you cut down on the fossil fuel use by 20%, which is almost unthinkably hard, but if you do that, it merely takes 20% longer to burn it all up. So it's running out is not a crazy thing to think about. So I'm gonna press you to the wall and ask, <laughs> what happened? 
we will be forced to come up with another solution. And we, we always have as an industry. We, you mean magic will happen? No, I think research will happen. Research and research has happened. Let me remind you that research does not make energy. Energy is conserved. Research only makes papers. Right now it would have to be nuclear, so it depends how soon, like nuclear and some of the, the renewables. I mean, we do have... Yeah. What happens when the nuclear runs out? Well, that, that buys us more time and then we're... Yeah, yeah, and solar and biofuels and other things have to be... It's true, we do have to face the reality that we have limited resources. So we do have to think about when fossil fuel runs out. However, in tandem, we also need to be proactively working on the solving of renewable energy sources. Yeah, and, and what I also liked a lot about his contribution was that it's not really um, a question of whether you believe in global warming or not, mm -hmm. but that you just have to accept this limitation of the resources. Yeah. So that was, yeah. I think, a very clever thing yeah. to, to get emotions out of this and just to say, okay, but we know it's finite, mm -hmm. so what do we do? There's an idea that I'm trying to get to float to the table here. Usually, when human beings don't have enough of something, they fight. Well, yeah. Okay? They it's fight. Too, yes. yeah. Now, it's not just historical, it's the way we are. Okay? Now, just imagine what happens if the second most important thing in all the world, after food, becomes in short supply. What mm -hmm. happens? War. And we're talking about highly advanced technical fighting. Mm -hmm. okay? And who's going to be doing this fighting? Not me, I'll be dead. Not you, probably you will, but your great, great, great grandchildren will be forced to make a terrible choice whether I'm going to protect my family or whether I'm going to let the other people win. And usually, people put themselves first. So the point is, if you're thinking about saving the future, it's your children that are at stake. That's the issue on the table that is supremely important, namely the the possibility that the, when, the, when the transition happens, there will be terrible struggles and people will die. I personally think that's a more imminent problem than destroying the world. Now other yeah. people have different views, but I think that's well, the big one. The, look, there are optimistic and pessimistic views. Civilization, on the, other, on the other hand, has been advancing. We're much better off. Of course, there are many difficulties, but we have solutions at hand. Solar energy, of course it's more expensive, but not so much more expensive that civilization has to come to an end or to fight and so on. It's clear, if you do the calculations, it takes a small piece of the Sahara Desert <laughs> to power the entire planet, but you people, of course, have to work very hard to do this, precisely to avoid this yeah. alternative, which I don't think is, uh, is unavoidable. Yeah, I think this time is a especially crucial because so many of the developed countries, we've actually been using about the same amount of energy for a while, but it's really the developing countries that their energy is skyrocketing, but we have this knowledge and they can skip some of those phases. You so, know, they I mean, they have, they they have solar panels in, in soccer balls, you know, they're not starting with the grid. Yeah. A different, Don't a different give, method oh, of the soccer balls, making energy with soccer kicking. <laughs> That's a the opposite of you. I'm really things. pleased to hear, Todd, but I don't want to hear silly things, okay? <laughs> this stuff is deadly serious. If you come up with some crazy science fiction, non, non, nonsense number for the jewel budget of the world, what you're going to have is war. This is serious. Now, right now, we are rich because civilization discovered how to take energy out of the ground. Our wealth is energy. It is a non sequitur to say that we will continue to be rich after the fossil fuels are gone. There's no reason at all to believe this. But how much more expensive is solar? Economists, but I'm sorry, but I disagree with that. The economists, the external, many others, they are talking about the cost of replacing that being one or two percent of global GDP. It's in the noise. The, the, the economy will double or triple. So the consensus among people that have looked very carefully at this, it's definitely possible. This is nonsense. The consensus among people who make energy, who, who make our lives, is that solar energy is nonsense. That's why they don't invest in it. This is well, wrong. Well, well, but they do. The but the economy then... The economists are idiots. The they don't make energy. They just sit around making theories. Well, the people who I make energy... Came, I just came from Seville and there's a big solar, concentrated solar power plant and they sell that. It's of course more expensive, but they are making photovoltaic cells in such a large scale 
that it, they claim it's now cheaper than concentrated solar power. So the mm. cost of solar energy is not that far from the cost of fossil fuel and the difference in cost between solar energy today and fossil fuel is a minor fraction of the overall econ economy. I trust that young people like yourselves work together with other young people and these complications with the economy and so on, if you're clever enough, you can actually deal with them. And we do have positive examples. We do have uh, things that have worked. Pick those up. And we have things that have failed terribly. Find them out and make sure they don't happen again. Do you think we're in the situation as dire as McLaughlin described it to be? Will we be going to war in the next hundred years over resources? I think it's important to realize that there's that possibility because energy is such an integral part of our lives. We need to be aware of that and how important it is, but use our time to do the research and make sure we're making advances in energy so we don't get to that point. The pessimism is making the students think hard about some very important things that aren't abstract. Trouble in the future when the world's energy supply gets tight. Now what I believe uh, is probably more optimistic. I think people can solve problems, but they won't unless they're scared. So I want to scare them and then they'll, they'll fix it. I like the more positive attitude of Molina. You know, the pessimistic picture may be yeah. good to, to raise attention and to raise the uh, awareness for an issue, How but it is. to get to solutions, I think it's, it's more interesting to look at possible solutions and uh, not to paint everything in black, maybe. Right. So. But I think the future is bright. I, I don't agree with uh, Dr. Laughlin that it's so pessimistic and that people will go to war over limited resources. Yes, we will always fight because people will always disagree, but people certainly have also shown in the past that we get together to solve the larger global issues. <laughs>